Jill Fearman, and I'm with Building Point Canada, and I'll be your host for the next hour for our presentation with Lon Ha. Uh, Building Point Canada is a Kansal company and a Trimble dealer with locations across Canada. We help uh, the building construction industry leverage constructible data, modeling, and real-time collaboration with software, field solutions, and professional services. Uh, Building Point is excited to be a sponsor here today at CanBem uh, to help showcase all these innovative startups and entrepreneurs. For more information on Building Point Canada, I have attached a handout on the right hand side of your screen there. And you are, of course, welcome to contact me directly. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we begin our presentation today. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side of your screen there, there's a couple of tabs, uh, one being the chat tab. Um, so you're welcome to uh, converse amongst yourselves during the presentation. Uh, just note that anything typed in the public domain will be made public to everyone in the presentation. So. Type carefully and respectfully. Um, for the Q&A portion of our session today, you'll see right next to chat is the Q&A tab. So any questions for Lon, please enter them under the Q&A tab. Um, these questions will be moderated and um, published uh, as, as they come up. And we're just going to make sure we don't have repetitive questions and um, take full advantage of Lon's time here today. Um, you're also welcome to vote on the questions once they're published. And so uh, if we notice a question that has generated a lot of interest, we will make sure it takes priority. And of course, if we are running a little short on time, then those questions with a number of votes will um, be answered first. Uh, so that brings us to our speaker presentation today. I'm excited to introduce Lon Ha, the CEO and president of Fund Scraper Capital Incorporated. After 10 years of experience in commercial and mixed use real property development, Lon embarked on a journey to create Fund Scraper, a technology platform that optimizes the entire investment process. And with that, I hand it over to you, Lon. Thank you, Jill, and thank you to Canbim for allowing us to present and introduce Fundscraper and talk about our journey uh, going from a startup four years ago to where we are today. Um, more than happy to uh, to speak afterwards and have a uh, engaging Q and A session. Um, but uh, but yeah, so uh, we do have a couple of polling questions. So the first question is. Um, are you currently an entrepreneur or planning to start your own business? Just feel free to um, answer that on the right side there under the polling section. Um, and there's two additional questions that we'd like to better understand uh, the audience base and, and I could perhaps uh, gear my presentation more towards uh, emphasize some of those items. So if you could just take a moment to answer some of the questions on the right there, that'd be perfect. Okay, so let me just share my slides here. Okay, so Fund Scraper is, as Jill mentioned, we are a real estate investment platform um, and we try to help individuals uh, from high net worth individuals to uh, just average individuals to be able to participate in real estate, private real estate offerings that they otherwise would not have access to. Um, my background comes from working in commercial property development. I worked at Canada's largest REIT for just over 10 years of my life. Um, and I worked with some of the most sophisticated institutional investors in Canada. Um, and I realized that some of the best investment opportunities are only available to uh, institutions or investment funds or private equity groups who could write 50 million, 100 million, $200 million checks. And so I knew that uh, just working in real estate, there's a lot of individual investors who may only have access to GICs or mutual funds or publicly traded securities. And so I knew that there was huge demand for, uh, for private real estate investments, but there was a massive gap in how people could access uh, great investment opportunities. And so I looked at the tools of today and realized that, hey, we have the internet, we have online apps, we have websites. Um, why not use today's tools to bridge that uh, demand for individual investors to participate 
uh, in investment offerings. So at the core of Fundscraper, uh, what we try to do um, is help investors pool together their capital uh, and invest together as a group uh, into larger investment opportunities that they otherwise would not be able to participate if they were doing it on their own. Uh, so I, I want to ask another question, just throw this out there. Um, given my experience in, in property development and working with some of the most sophisticated investors, um, what would you guys think is the investment strategy most utilized uh, by some of the largest real estate investors? So I highlighted some of the largest uh, institutional investors in Canadian real estate. Um, so Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, Omer's Pension Plan, and the Case de Depot in, in Quebec. Um, what they do or what they embark upon is they allocate obviously a, a portion of their investment portfolio. So these three entities combined is, is about $75 billion of capital that they are allocating towards real estate. And so if you look at how they participate in the real estate market, they're not really purchasing or investing into publicly traded REITs. They're not purchasing uh, real estate based mutual funds. They're not uh, investing into third party uh, or uh, investing into publicly traded securities to get exposure to the real estate asset class. If you look at the fair majority of their capital, over 90% of that $75 billion is allocated towards direct real estate investing. Um, so what they do is they do a co-ownership uh, structure or they do joint ventures, uh, or they specifically select individual portfolios of asset classes uh, that they want to participate in, in real estate and they select the right partner to invest with. Um, so that investment strategy is really only open and available to um, uh, some of the largest investors. And we're trying to provide that direct real estate investment through pools or through uh, funds uh, to be able to participate similar to the biggest institutional investors, because I would say uh, that that investment strategy is probably the, uh, one of the best ways to uh, allocate some of your portfolio towards real estate investing. So, and that speaks to the genesis of why we created Fundscraper. Um, it's using the technology that we have today um, to make it seamless, make it easier uh, for investors to have uh, exposure of their investment portfolio towards uh, private real estate. So we offer uh, both debt opportunities and equity opportunities on our platform. Our management team takes uh, spends a lot of time sourcing, uh, underwriting, and structuring um, some of these investment opportunities um, so that whenever an, an investor signs up on our platform, uh, they could browse through a variety of investment pools uh, and, and funds and assets to be able to participate in. Uh, and they get to pick and choose uh, which opportunities uh, match their risk and return profiles. Um, so uh, we're truly giving them that similar kind of investment strategy that the biggest and most sophisticated investment uh, managers use to get exposure to real estate investing. So the idea actually came to me in, in December 2013, um, and it was essentially a four year process uh, to get it off the ground because some of the key uh, foundational pieces in order to launch um, Fundscraper you really needed to have a core founding management team because we are operating in a highly regulated industry, private securities, private investment, um, uh, managing uh, investor investments, that's highly, highly regulated. And so you need to get the requisite licensing in place. You need to have the management team that understands existing and future securities laws, rules and regulations. Uh, and me coming from a development and real estate background, I didn't know much about corporate securities or investment uh, investment securities uh, and the difference between um, the regulations in private and public markets. Uh, and so we had to truly build a, uh, a well-rounded and experienced management team um, to be able to provide that expertise. And that took a lot, that took a lot of time. Um, and uh, it took us four years before we got where we had to build a website, we had to build a platform, we had to uh, design all the workflows before even doing a single transaction. We had to design all the workflows so that it was fully compliant with existing securities laws. 
And then we had to submit our application as uh, a exempt market dealer. That's one of the licenses that you need to get uh, in order to uh, do the things that we're doing in the private investment market. Um, and that whole process took four years. So in January 2017, that's when we uh, commenced commercial operations, uh, which is after we received our regulatory license in three provinces, four, pro four provinces uh, in Canada. And today we now have licensing in six provinces um, and we uh, offer securities uh, throughout um, uh, investment opportunities throughout North America. So to give you an idea of some of the offerings that we have on our platform, um, they generally uh, range in terms of pools of asset classes, funds, um, single asset opportunities uh, that form a part of a larger pool. Um, and they could be land loans, first mortgages, second mortgages, um, equity offerings where it's a development project and you're investing through uh, limited partnerships. Uh, all of our investments um, are done, are structured through limited partnerships. Um, and uh, it's, it's not exactly a direct way to invest into real estate, um, but it is a way to, to uh, have a, uh, an equitable interest in the offering. Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to find which, which opportunities are appropriate uh, for uh, investors. Um, and uh, when we first started, we imagined doing a lot more equity offerings. Um, and uh, we realized that the turnaround time for equity offerings is just too long and investors need something that pays out uh, a little bit quicker. They need to start seeing that they earn a return because you're still trying to establish a relationship with investors. Um, and uh, if you present too many, uh, if, you're, if your main product are equity offerings, and they only mature in anywhere from three or complete in three to five years, uh, that's a lot of time for you to be able to grow your user base and demonstrate um, scalable transaction activity. Uh, so then we pivoted more towards uh, the uh, debt opportunities. So as you guys can imagine, um, building an investment marketplace is, is, is very challenging. And I highlight some of the main challenges here uh, because you have the compliance side of the business where uh, you have to be able to operate within existing securities laws. Um, and a lot of these securities laws were written 20, 30, 40 years ago. So they didn't really imagine online technologies allowing investors to participate. And so compliance is a huge part of the business. Um, you have to have the ability to do credit underwriting, which is completely distinct and separate from compliance. Uh, credit underwriting is about how do you evaluate an investment opportunity and, and structure in such a way that it makes sense uh, for uh, all those involved, and especially the investors. Um, and then you have to build a what we call the B2C or uh, uh, the consumer side of the business where the clients are coming onto the platform, they're signing up um, and they're evaluating investment opportunities. You have to build and translate um, uh, a, 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 the human relationship in a digital environment. And that has significant challenges because for someone to, let's say, stumble upon the Fundscriper website and they live in Alberta and they don't know any of our management team members, they don't really uh, uh, know too much about Fundscraper, um, we have to really uh, nurture that relationship for them to understand uh, what our service offering is, uh, how to invest, what they can invest into and what's appropriate for their investment. So there's a lot of nurturing that we have to do with uh, a huge emphasis on investor education. Um, and then getting the product out the door, what should we focus on? Should we, finding that product market fit um, really depends on understanding what your customer segments uh, really wanna see on your platform. Um, and so a lot of customer feedback, a lot of uh, 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 polling and surveys and having conversations with uh, our investors to be able to understand what kind of segment they belong into and what kind of uh, investment opportunities that that segment wants uh, to see more of. Um, and also uh, digital acquisition, uh, that one's very difficult. Um, I don't come from a background of marketing or, uh, or anything digital really. Um, cracking the nut on how to find uh, potential uh, clients and users for the platform and then getting them through that onboarding process. Um, because for compliance reasons, we have to know 
your income. We have to know your net assets. We have to net, know your net financial assets. We have to know where you live, uh, your SIN number, your birthday, all those things we have to evaluate as part of the investment onboarding process before you can make an investment. And so uh, developing trust and credibility is, is huge and that forms a part of the digital acquisitions uh, uh, side. So it, building Fundscraper is unlike building, let's say a social app because there are completely separate and distinct components of the business. Um, I often tell uh, my team members that we're, we're effectively building three businesses, a lending business, a technology business where other companies could utilize our technology and then a compliance uh, um, uh, business and asset management business. So uh, there's a lot of things there. Key to the source of our growth is uh, our access to debt capital and financing sources. Um, just like any other investment bank, when they underwrite a deal, they could purchase the deal in advance. Um, and you need to have balance sheet capital or external financing sources through lines of credit or other finance facilities in order to uh, have deals in place already to list onto the platform. Uh, we're not merely just listing the deals on the platform and hoping that investors will uh, fill that investment opportunity. Um, what we are doing is uh, for certain opportunities, uh, we're underwriting them and then listing them on the platform. And that requires a lot of uh, external and internal uh, financing sources to be able to do that uh, because we want to give diversity to our uh, uh, registered users and investor clients um, in order to do that and scale that up we really need access to uh, other sources of capital uh, to, to then list it on the platform so i'd like to highlight some of the solutions that we had to some of these major problems and, and issues of building a marketplace um, one of the key things that we decided to do uh, early on in our development was joining a technology accelerator. And we were for very fortunate to join the Ryerson uh, DMZ technology accelerator. They were ranked number one in the world, I believe, in 2017 or 2018. Um, and I could fully understand why. Um, the day that we joined, um, they put us through a very rigorous program um, and that speaks to lesson number one. Um, I never had a professional mentor that I paid. Uh, and uh, it speaks to um, our, our, at the time, lack of knowledge on knowing exactly what needs to be done. And so there's very few people that you could speak to who understand building a marketplace, let alone a real estate investment marketplace. So having access to the resources in the form of professional mentors that are paid by the technology accelerator to sit down with you one hour a week um, through a structured program. Uh, I remember at the height of it, I had four to six mentors a week. So that's an entire day allocated towards just mentorship meetings to speak with um, uh, individuals who are experts in digital marketing, experts in uh, product uh, segmenting uh, and product uh, def definitions, um, operations, data analytics. And so having the resources uh, at the DMZ and any other technology accelerator, that's hugely important for anyone who's embarking on this journey, their own personal journey or, uh, or their team journey of building a company. Um, I, I would highly recommend uh, uh, seeking um, uh, the resources at a technology accelerator because that was a huge thing that allowed us to hone in our focus and that gave us frameworks um, that really helped us make decisions on where we should go in terms of making decisions uh, for tactical, operational, and even strategic uh, uh, decisions. Um, and, and you need that a sounding board where a lot of those mentors have, um, have gone through their journey, they've built their companies, they've sold their companies, or they exit their companies in some form or another fashion, um, and to be able to learn from their mistakes and learn from their uh, lessons, it's hugely important. But it really changes the relationship when they're getting paid and there is a structured agenda and program uh, that isn't just on a session by session basis. Uh, the other lesson that, uh, that we learned uh, from the being a technology accelerator uh, and throughout our journey is um, that I want to emphasize is that sales is really a process. You, we learned that you can't really skip steps. 
Um, so if the sales process is, let's say, 15 to 20 steps, in our sales process, there's over 23 steps. Um, we break it down into very detailed operational steps. And if you skip one of them, the other steps don't work. And so by understanding your, call it your sales funnel in a very detailed operational manner and tracking the metrics at each of those stages and seeing where the flow rate is impacted by going through each of those stages, that was, that was monu a monumental lesson for me because I just thought that you go out there and you talk to people and you get them to invest. It's, that's not as simple as that. Um, and there's different categories of stages where different marketing assets work best for stage one or stage two or stage three or stage 23. Um, and so you really need to understand what your sales funnel is for your site customer segments um, and then really engineer that um, so that you can make it much more efficient over time. Uh, and then the, the other lesson is the... Um, uh, the ten percent rule, which I'll, I'll get to shortly. So, going back to product market strategy and finding product market fit, um, hyper segmentation is hugely valuable because, yes, the the vision of the company is to allow investors to participate in real estate investment offerings. Um, but what product do you go out with first, and what segment do you target uh, first as well? And so building a marketplace, you, you kind of have to match those two segments. So on for our, our marketplace, there's demand for capital. So those are the real estate developers, investment uh, funds, uh, mortgage investment entities, mortgage investment corps. Um, and then on the other side, there's the supply of capital. There's the senior investor who's looking for a very secure, stable investment where they cannot uh, risk losing any principal and they just want some income. Uh, to the investor who is in their early 30s, who paid off all of their student debt, and now they have some excess cash, um, and they don't may not have enough cash to invest into their principal property, but they want some exposure to real estate um, in their portfolio. Um, so they have a very different risk tolerance and investment objective than someone at the other end of the spectrum in terms of the customer segment. So being able to really understand what each of those customer segments are looking for and then matching that with the re relevant investment offerings that they would find more appealing to match with themselves. So that's the challenge because you don't want to have a lopsided marketplace. You don't want to have too much investor capital uh, from one segment and then not being able to source the investment opportunities on the other side because then you'll lose credibility. So you kind of have to really match uh, the two at the, uh, at the right time uh, and be able to manage the transitions from each stage. Uh, so a clear example for us is um, when we first started looking at equity opportunities, that targeted a different kind of investor. Now that we're emphasis is more on the debt opportunities, we start to appeal to different kinds of investors. And now that we're living in a pandemic, where people are maybe more uncertain about real estate values or they're uncertain about their career and income, that requires a different, a more defensive, a more conservative product. Uh, and so you have to be able to understand the market, have your eyes, ears, eyes and ears close to the ground um, and be able to pivot really rapidly uh, to match the uh, changing consumer behaviors uh, and or product, uh, appropriate product offerings. So this one's uh, something that we use all the time. Um, so the 10% rule, um, the 10% rule is, is really, cause you have so many options to select what kind of product, how you wanna go to the market. So what we try to do is we reverse engineer at the early stages of fund scraper. Um, we ask ourselves, what market can we easily capture with the least amount of work so that we could capture only 10% of that market? And is that 10% of that market sufficient enough to take us to the next stage? So some people define that 10% as a million dollars in revenue. Uh, some people define that in using different metrics. So let's just take the revenue metric, for example. The, the reason why we use 10% is that's a small enough size that's realistic for a new entrant or a new startup to be able to capture um, without uh, 
impacting the existing marketplace too much. If your assumption is, let's say it's a, a $5 billion market and in order to break even, you need to capture 50% of the market, well, any potential investor trying to back your platform is going to say, well, that's really aggressive growth. And so uh, you have to be really, call it humble or modest in your expectations of what you can capture. Um, and if you think about Fund for today, I, there's, I don't know of any other pure play um, investment platform that only focuses on real estate in Canada. And so uh, you could argue that, hey, we're going to capture uh, 60, 70, 80 percent of this market. But you have to think about it in alternative asset classes and in, 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 in complementary assets. We are targeting the investor's wallet. Uh, and there's only a small portion of the investor wall that should be uh, allocated to, towards private real estate. So back to the example, um, if we want to generate a million dollars in revenue, what market out there could we capture to that is only 10% of that market in order to hit a million dollars of revenue? Is it equity offerings in the GTA or downtown core Toronto? Is it first position mortgages in um, in, Nor in in Alberta and, and BC and Ontario? Is it second mortgage commercial bridge financings uh, for uh, 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 land um, uh, purchase or land acquisition opportunities? So you kind of have to figure out what product segment you want to capture. Um, or is it the technology side of the business where we are uh, white labeling our technology to certain customers. And so really focusing on that first 10% and the really defining that market and then focusing your marketing on that, that market um, is hugely valuable because it defines a simple metric, easy to communicate to your clients and your team members and defines a certain focus. Um, and after you capture that 10% market, okay, we'll hop over to the next market uh, to grow the next 10% to get to the next stage. Because you can't assume that whatever product that you have today is going to be the same uh, in, in the future. That speaks to how we pivoted and adapted the product. Uh, we went from a focus on equity offerings to debt offerings, um, and debt offerings uh, opened up more opportunities across North America. Um, and really, the key to all of this and being able to adapt is having a solid and experienced uh, foundation, which I consider the management team. Uh, I would not have been able to do any of this without any of the uh, team members on the platform, uh, let alone the senior founding team members. So Gregory Colford, um, he came from a, uh, a background in corporate securities, who's a Bay Street lawyer, um, launched and managed a, a billion dollar fund on behalf of a pension plan. Uh, for uh, mortgage investment opportunities for the seniors home uh, construction uh, offering opportunities all across North America. Um, and I was very fortunate to be able to uh, uh, to uh, to build this management team. It did take us a lot of time, took us four years. Um, and John uh, Pizal, he's our general counsel. And and I consider both Gregory and John my mentors and, and, and advisors on all things personal, professional, all sorts of things. Uh, John was also a former Bay Street um, a lawyer, managing partner at a major law firm in, in Toronto. Uh, and he, um, uh, after he left his partnership, he managed a large commercial real estate company. Uh, Terrence, he's a, we, we went to school together and we worked together. Um, and we, uh, uh, he was one of the first early uh, founding team members on the platform. And so, uh, it's, it was very, it's great for me to be able to work with Terrence, uh, to, from going from school to, uh, professional work to startup work, uh, and now building and scaling this, this platform across North America. And of course, Todd, uh, we stumbled upon Todd through one of our board advisors. Um, and, uh, he brings to us such, um, institutional, uh, call it tech development. Uh, processes and procedures and just the rigor of the 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 analysis is is just exceptional um so uh i have a, a very strong senior major team um that is foundational uh to us being able to uh to build uh at the especially at the earlier stages having that expertise to build us and launch us 
Uh, and also we have uh, on our, our marketing team, uh, Horatio, Niki, um, and hopefully one other team member that we're trying to uh, uh, to secure to be our uh, VP of marketing. Um, that's going to round out um, uh, uh, the rest of our team. But uh, uh, from the most uh, the youngest team members to the most senior team members, they all play a huge role in what we're doing. Um, and it's that constant pivot and adaptability and our ability to execute that is why we're successful. It's not so much the uh, the idea or uh, or uh, or the genesis of Funscript, it's, it's it's really the team members and our ability to work together uh, and adapt and shift to uh, changing uh, environments. So some of the milestones that we achieved applying those four or five main, call it lessons learned. Um, so commence commercial operations 2017. Um, our first $100 million uh, process in place through our platform, um, that took us two years. Um, we kept refining our process, kept tweaking things, kept optimizing things. Our next, uh, how I know our tweaking and optimizing work was because our next 100 million we processed in place um, in less than uh, 12 months. So we shortened the time frame in, in, in half. Uh, and our next 100 million, we, which we breached, uh, I think a month and a half ago, um, uh, we did that in less than 10 months. Um, so uh, it was, by by having that solid foundation in terms of process, people, plans, um, and product, uh, we were able to um, grow our user base to over six x uh, in the last um, call it eighteen months, um, and and also to uh, really uh, place a, a very large amount of capital, uh, which uh, uh, I, I couldn't have imagined we've done in such a short period of time, um, but. Uh, for 2020 onwards and 2021, uh, the future growth of our platform is going to be in a new vehicle that we call the Fundscript for Property Trust, uh, and more about that shortly. Um, but we haven't really announced that to the public yet, so I think uh, this session is the first time we're really uh, exposing the Fundscript for Property Trust um, as an investment vehicle, uh, and we'll speak more to that shortly. Um, so actually, we'll speak to it right now. So uh, the Fundscript or Property Trust, uh, just speaking about going back to the idea of pivoting and really adapting your product um, in this current environment with new regulations and all that fun stuff, um, the Fundscript or Property Trust is what we would consider Canada's first fully electronic real estate investment vehicle. Um, this vehicle is aiming to deliver pools of investment opportunities uh, to our investor base, just like a mutual fund where it's a pool of, uh, of, of, of companies in a mutual fund, we're delivering a pool of asset classes in real estate where the investors could pick and choose which ones they want to participate in. So the differentiating factors for this is to have uh, lower investment minimums. Um, some, of our, uh, some of the offerings in Canadian real estate today, if you invest, um, it will be anywhere from $50,000 to $250,000 minimums. With Fundscript or Property Trust, we're going to have much, much lower minimums to that. Um, and uh, we, we would suggest uh, everyone to sign up on the platform, sign up to our newsletter um, to uh, get a hold of the launch date. Um, and that will give them access to viewing some of the opportunities on our platform. Um, and we wanted to give investors the ability to participate in larger offerings that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own. Um, and we want to deliver a stable uh, monthly income uh, and through distributions to our investors. So uh, mortgages pay on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. Uh, we want to deliver that cash flow to uh, investors and investors could invest through uh, their registered capital. So their TFSA or their RSPs um, or their RIFs or Lira accounts. And so we're uh, working to de uh, uh, deliver this before the end of this year. Um, and we invite everyone to uh, join our newsletter to, uh, to, uh, to keep up to date on the going ons of Fundscraper. Um, and at this point in time, uh, I do want to open the floor to Q and A, um, so that we could, uh, just, uh, add more context and color to our discussion. Um, and after the, after the presentation and after the session ends, uh, we'd like to offer all the audience members, uh, to have a coffee on us, 
um, just go to this link. Uh, it's also in the handout in the lower left-hand corner. Um, if you guys uh, click on the link and then uh, create uh, a, a basic profile account, uh, then we'll send you a $5 Starbucks uh, gift card um, and pretend that we're there having coffee with you. So I back to Jill or Sergey uh, for to open up the q and i I'm more than happy to answer any questions and we could be, uh, you could reach out to Niki, our marketing coordinator or myself directly uh, with the details here. More than happy to have a conversation after the presentation or 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 meet up when we're able to uh, in person to to get into the more granular things. And if there are people who are trying to launch their company, um, more than happy to share with you my resources, Funscope resources, um, and talk about how how we did it as well. Perfect. Thank you, Lon. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so as Lon said, we're about to begin our question and answer period. So quick reminder, um, if you have a question that you would like to have answered by Lon, please put it in the Q&A tab and uh, I will make sure that um, Lon is able to view that. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Our first one from Tom K. Uh, so, Lon, what are the main reasons borrowers deal with you rather than an MIC or other private lenders? Yeah, it's it's a great question. We get asked that very, very often from uh, potential borrowers or lenders or those requiring the capital. Um, a lot of it is based upon relationships. So, um, and by relationships, I mean a trusting relationship. So, as a lender, as an investor, uh, as a a uh, platform that is promising to deliver capital to your project, um, can they rely on our commitments? Um, so one uh, significant to do with trust. Um, so whenever we provide a commitment letter, we execute on that and we, we don't cancel our commitments. So the certainty of deliver, delivery of capital, that's one huge thing. Uh, the timeliness of the delivery of that capital, uh, that's another thing. Uh, and then the ability to work with them. So whenever the project may encounter some delays or trouble, they want to know that we will work with them to help them uh, complete the project. Um, practically speaking, obviously, as uh, us being a lender or one of our funds being a lender, we have the ability or our loan administrator has the ability to enforce a mortgage. And so do we just surprise them with a notice of, of, of enforcement or do we work together and understand how to uh, help them uh, navigate through any trouble that they're, they're going through? And more often than not, you'll, the investors will be better off if you work with that borrower. Um, so a lot of it is uh, timeliness. Um, it hasn't to do much with pricing because uh, if you could deliver capital three weeks or four weeks or two months earlier than someone else, then they actually will probably pay more uh, in terms of the cost of that capital. Uh, but at the end of the day, given our technology and if we um, optimize our technology properly, we do want to be the lowest cost of capital provider uh, for, uh, for uh, issuer clients. Now, we don't we try our best not to compete with the existing incumbents in the marketplace because we have to be a platform, a technology service and a marketplace that adds value to the existing market, whether it's traditional, offline, online. Um, and so we actually work with other uh, investment uh, companies, lenders, mortgage investment uh, entities to help them get liquidity so that they could um, source uh, additional deals. And so a large, uh, a very large part of our business is, is centered around that um, in terms of processing, in terms of technology support, in terms of uh, front end uh, digital marketing. So we do provide a whole range of services to help uh, existing, call it incumbents in the market, uh, whether you're a private lender or a large scale publicly traded lender, we give them our platform to work with us uh, to scale up their operation as well. Perfect, thank you. So it's like a part, it's like a, uh, not a legal partnership, but it's a partnership where we're working together uh, to achieve uh, everyone's uh, objectives. Perfect. 
Uh, thanks, Lon. So the next question we have here, in absence of having an accelerator ecosystem or prior to having one, what advice do you give to new entrepreneurs? Uh, so uh, I, I believe the presentation will be available um, after as well. And so one of the key lessons is if you're at the stage of just deciding to leave, because I saw one of the questions here, uh, it asked whether or not I was working full time or part time. I, I was working part time for the first four years. Uh, I was working part time on Fundscraper and full time at my uh, uh, previous job um, to build Fundscraper. I didn't see a need to to because you had to get regulatory approval because you had to build a management team. So really, uh, doing things when you feel comfortable to do them. There's no um, yes, you want to have full commitment. Yes, you want to have uh, complete focus. But because I was working in real estate, um, it, it was it was still within the same industry, so I could still uh, transfer my skill set to what I'm doing at Fundscraper. Um, but uh, if you're at that stage where you're you're thinking about launching, you're trying to launch, well, in the evenings um, you still have a little bit of time to really focus uh, on how you want to execute on your vision or your goal. So we have a over 160 page business plan. We have a 85 page marketing plan and we don't even use those documents anymore, but I produced those documents um, before fully launching Fundscraper to really focus uh, my mindset, doing the appropriate research, the analysis, uh, understanding the structures that are out there and taking educational courses. I had to take five courses in order to be qualified as what they call an ultimate designated person because of the compliance stuff. So I was working full time, launching Fundscraper, trying to launch Fundscraper, building major team, and I took five courses. So you have, you do have some time to explore the the, the critical path to getting yourself comfortable uh, in order to take that risk. And for me, my personal journey, it took four years before uh, I was comfortable taking that risk. And a big part of that was having a solid uh, major team, Gregory, John, Terrence, Todd, that was with me to commit myself full time to this. So you need to know what your resources are, what resources you have access to. Um, uh, certainly you don't want to, because things much take much, much longer than you expect. You don't only want to have staying power of three months or six months um, because it takes much longer than that. Uh, I mean, our initial homepage design took us six months. I don't, I don't even know why, but um, you need to have a huge buffer. So if you're going to commit full time to it, either have the revenues in place um, or uh, or have the tolerance and the wherewithal and the staying power through alternate resources to be able to refine your product because it takes a boatload amount of time. So be prepared to have an extended time horizon timeline uh, and then line up your resources, whether that is revenues or investment capital to, to really uh, invest the required. It's not just the time that you need to invest, it's the time, the resources uh, and having the major team with the expertise to assist you in the areas that I, I was very weak on you know, or didn't know anything about. Um, and so complementary uh, or, or yeah, complementary skill sets to help you grow uh, and launch properly. Um, but uh, the key thing is um, if I look back, I probably would have should have focused on revenue earlier and more. Um, but that goes to the difficulty of building a marketplace. You have to do so many things at different times. Um, so it's really just whatever you're comfortable with, prioritize it, do the 10% rule and get that revenue because a paying customer uh, is the best validation of your product or service. Now you could under underprice your product um, and get customers and yeah, they'll be paying, uh, they'll be paying customer, but if your unit economics don't make sense, then you can't really scale that. Um, however, you need to look at the lifetime value, the longevity of that customer. If you could upsell them other services, at some point in the future, then that goes towards the value of undercutting today to land that client and then building the revenues over time. So these things, you, you, like only you will understand that by having conversations with your potential clients or customers. Um, so focus on revenue, do the 10% rule um, and speak to your uh, customers. Great, so I guess following up on that, a question from Rowena, uh, how much will be the initial cost for the 10% you have discussed? Um, so 
uh, how I interpret that question is how much capital should you have to build your business? So for us, um, you need to have capital to hire designers, to uh, pay uh, external consultants, uh, pay lawyers, pay designers, pay um, uh, have overhead for your for your team, building the overall platform, technology services. There are very cheap ways to do that, and then there are very expensive ways to do that. So it completely varies. But I know, I mean, if you look at Silicon Valley and some of the companies in the United States um, with X dollars, they were able to get an MVP. So MVP is minimum viable product. Um, I don't want to throw out a number there because I, I kind of I think you need to uh, do the research to see what is your minimum viable product that you need to get your first paying customer or contract or 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 pathway to some revenue. It could be thirty thousand, could be a hundred thousand, could be five hundred thousand dollars. So um, certainly you don't want to spend five hundred thousand dollars before you have a, your first paying customer. Um, but uh, t take a look at the timelines of some of the startup companies in the United States, what they started off with. Um, but uh, time is also a resource. It's not just a dollar and cents thing. It's, it's the opportunity cost of your time. So if you have to leave your, your full-time job to do this and you're uh, giving up X thousands of dollars per month uh, in revenue, I mean, th there's that opportunity cost as well. So you got to factor that into your calculation. Um, but you do need uh, a, a small chunk of change uh, to design your product and create a minimum viable product. Um, but there's there are technologies and solutions out there that can really lower your cost, um, like the, the the website builders, uh, the things that have cr give you the ability to create an online store, um, and that really helps with uh, managing your cost. But you you need to figure out what your MVP product is to get your first paying customer. And then budget from there. Great. Thank you. Uh, from Michael C., do you source all your investment opportunities yourself or do you consider proposals from outsiders? Meaning, do you take here pitches for property proposals? Yeah, all the time. We're more than happy to work with uh, brokers or other investment entities. Um, if they need help with uh, raising capital, we're more than happy to have that discussion. Uh, and yeah, we have a very uh, rigorous uh, eyes and criteria, and we're more than happy to share what that criteria is um, to, to meet with what we're looking for um, to either invest into or fund or raise capital for. Um, so we're, yeah, we work with uh, all types of brokers and mortgage investment entities and other investment entities um, because we need to, uh, as mentioned before, we need to plug in with the existing marketplace and incumbents uh, and add value to all the players in the industry um, in order to be a viable, sustainable business. And that's one of the ways we do that. Okay, so we just have one more question here um, from Sadiq. Did you start paying salaries to your team members from day one or they came on board with no salaries until the business started to be profitable? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, if, I mean, practically speaking, if you don't have the revenues yet and you don't have uh, uh, the investor capital or the investors backing you to build the business, then certainly you cannot pay cash salary. Um, so at a certain stage when you have uh, investors backing your business, then that's a, that's the point in time where you have the cash to, to pay salaries. So you need to find that major team at the early stage. If you don't have the financial resources that truly believes in the vision that could really see the light at the end of the tunnel on on what we're trying to do here as an organization um, and you and you pay them with something that's probably even more uh expensive than cash it's you got to give them equity and so there are numerous structures that that companies undertake to uh to to create the right kind of um call it alignment with your early backers your early team members um, and that varies depending on your product, depending on your timeline, and depending on the risk that is being undertaken uh, by everyone involved. And so you, you got to have conversations and make sure that um, they all uh, believe uh, in uh, the, the vision and trajectory of the business 
and they'd be more comfortable taking on that risk uh, and or deferring uh, their uh, p potential salary. Uh, so that's that's something that's, I think it's, it's very uh, contextual. So depending on what kind of team members you bring on board at the early, early days, um, but I don't see any other way to do it uh, unless you have seed investors or angel investors right off the bat. And you won't be able to do that um, uh, without making a significant investment up front. Like you need to have some sort of MVP before a, a, a angel round comes to you uh, or a seed investor uh, makes an investment into you, into you for you to pay the salaries. And so um, just like how I said, you yourself need to have the staying power to do this for the long term or for a time horizon that is double or triple that you initially project. Um, same thing with your team members, your initial founding team members. They also need to have that staying power. Um, otherwise, you put yourself uh, uh, in a situation where you are desperate to do something um, before you may not have uh, discovered what your initial product market fit is. Okay, so we're coming up uh, to the end of our session here. So if anyone has any outstanding questions that they'd like to ask, please submit them uh, shortly. Um, Bilal has asked how to make uh, the investor profile status eligible. Or how do you consider so, Yeah, um, so almost anyone is able to invest into some of the offerings on our platform so you just go to uh, just go go through this uh, coffee link um the can bin link um uh, and then complete your profile so all you really need is an email uh, and create a password and then you'll be asked a series of questions um to uh, see what kind of investor you are um, once you complete that profile um you will be the system will uh, define you as uh, one of three categories, credit investor, eligible investor, or the third category. Um, and it's a function of net assets. So uh, what your net worth is, it's a function of your net financial or your net financial assets, or it's a function of your income. Um, and so, uh, or it, it's a function of your, uh, call it registration status. So if you are, let's say, a portfolio manager or a mutual fund dealer or licensed in some uh, capacity as uh, working in the investment uh, industry, uh, that, that also uh, puts you into a different category of investors. But our system will walk you through that. Um, you'll still be able to view some of the offerings regardless of your status, um, but whether or not you're able to participate in certain offerings, uh, that's subject to what kind of investor you are based upon your profile and your answers. Great. So uh, I don't have any other outstanding questions. Um, one last shout out for anyone uh, who has any final thoughts that they'd uh, they'd like to speak to Lon about. Um, but uh, that was standing. Lon, thank you for your presentation today. That was very insightful and congratulations on all of your hard work and success. I think it takes a certain amount of bravery to uh, take an idea and put it into motion. So yeah. Well done. Thank you guys for that. I want to thank Building Point as well for sponsoring uh, called the the, the uh, Canbim conference and event, uh, and also Canbim and the DMZ for inviting me to participate. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's all about the management team and and surrounding yourself with team members uh, that could support uh, the goals of the business and add uh, their unique expertise to it. So spend your time to find the right. Um, team members to to go on that journey together and and just make it fun while you're doing it. That's uh, as little we try to make it as little stress as possible. It's it's hard to do that, um, but we want to try and like build that culture. It comes from uh, the, t the 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 team members and having a strong major team to be able to adapt um, and uh, really focus on that and, and revenue. Wonderful. So actually, one last question yeah. sneak in here from Venus. What do you suggest to do for networking during your early days? Oh, yeah, it's hugely, hugely important. So being in an ecosystem, so plugging in. So before I left my job at Recan, actually, I love my job at Recan. I miss it dearly. Uh, it was a great company doing some awesome projects all across Canada. And, and, and I, I love my, uh, it was like the development group was like a small a uh, small business within a larger organization. But um, I really looked forward to join the technology ecosystem here in Toronto. I mean, 
Toronto was on the top 10 list for Amazon to locate their secondary headquarters. Uh, Microsoft launched their, is building their $750 million head office in Canada here. Um, you have a pool of talent from Kitchener Waterloo. You have uh, educational organizations with, like in downtown Toronto that you could go to attend sessions. Uh, and those are all designed in a way they're networking sessions. There are over a dozen technology accelerators in Southern Ontario. Um, so there are so many things and resources that you have. We selected the DMZ technology accelerator and just being there, we were within a cohort of eight to 12 other startup companies, all founders and their senior team members going through that process and journey together. So it's very important to surround yourself with people and companies within the ecosystem because uh, you'll see what other people are going through. Um, and a lot of different companies and different people are going through very similar issues. And so you'll be able to chit chat, you'll build a network, um, but there are so many organizations here in Toronto and in Southern Ontario um, that, that allow you to network. Obviously much more difficult now, but there are the web summits, there are the large global and local um, uh, webinars and conferences focus on technology and startups and fintech in different sectors. There are meetups. Uh, there were the monthly events um, uh, organized by TechTO. Those were great events too. Um, and uh, and really just uh, taking courses, uh, mark, uh, digital marketing classes at BrainStation or, or some of those other educational organizations that really make it, um, uh, that give you the opportunity to network with people. And uh, I, I realized how insulated I was, even at Canada's largest street, there's only a certain, call it profile that I was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I worked with architects, engineers, consultants, lawyers, uh, uh, city staff uh, and public officials. And yet there was this whole other world that, I, that blew me away um, in, on the technology side. And so seeing what kind of organizations are out there and just join them, join the email list as a simple step. Uh, and then reaching out to people on LinkedIn uh, after they do a conference or after you meet them at an event, uh, that is hugely um, uh, valuable to, to us because uh, in the startup world or ecosystem, everybody, I think, wants to help out each other. And so they share resources. Um, I have a VC list of, I think, 600 companies. So imagine you doing that yourself and trying to find 600 venture capital firms in North America and then building a list or I could email it to you and you'll have it in, in 30 seconds. So it's just, just doing things like that saves time and, and, and people understand the challenges uh, to some extent. And so they're, they're, they're really there to help. And that's the great thing about uh, being in the Toronto uh, technology ecosystem. Wonderful. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our session today with Lon Ha. Lon, thank you again. I think we've all gained from your experience. Uh, I thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference with Can Bim. Um, so now you are free to go and uh, get your Starbucks coffee, compliments of Fun Scraper, and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, have a good one. Thanks, Lon. Thank you guys. Bye.